In this video, I'm going to give you my honest opinion and rating of the mythical expansion Forgotten Saga in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Subscribe to the Linus Wilson channel. We give you the secrets to crush Assassin's Creed Valhalla. So I've played all the paid expansions and all the free expansions in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. I think this mythical expansion Forgotten Saga is one of the best free DLCs and it stacks up uh, almost, almost as long, maybe longer than the paid DLC Dawn of Ragnarok in terms of the amount of time you're probably going to spend in it. So I think it's actually a great expansion, especially for people that have already done the Asgard and Jotunheim arcs within the game. Definitely, if you own Dawn of Ragnarok, this is the sequel to Dawn of Ragnarok, and it explains the story of Dawn of Ragnarok in the ending uh, about the mystery about Baldur. So at the end, we'll talk about some stories some story spoilers but for the beginning we're going to keep the story spoilers out of it. it this is a roguelite mode which means that you have to if odin dies so uh eivor is dreaming as odin in everold's hut everold's is a new character with a new hut that's been added uh with patch 1.60 uh starting in august 2022 this is this expansion uh, me is a roguelite, and so you've got uh, things that you can take out, memories, dreams, and thoughts. Thoughts are used to upgrade armor sets, which can only be used in the mythical expansion, Forgotten Saga. Odin is trying to find his son Baldur in Helheim or Niflheim. He has to go through four regions and fight four bosses, and then do a lot of other lockbox and... Uh, sword quests uh, to get there on the way. And you have some uh, choice in terms of your path. You can't do everything in one run. And uh, as Odin goes through the world, uh, the, the four different regions, one is dominated by snow, one is dominated by lava, one is dominated by acid, uh, and one is the castle of Helheim, of, of, of the queen of the underworld hell. And then, uh, you know, each each region is distinctly different and also showcases different things. So region one is very much similar to the Jotunheim part of the main game, which you can do, I think, power level 130 after you built Valka's Hut. You need to have built Valka's Hut, so you need a settlement level three, so you, your Eivor needs to have gotten to England before you can do any of these mythical realms, including the Forgotten Saga DLC mode. The second region is uh, similar to uh, Muspelheim and is very reminiscent of the areas that you may see in the Dawn of Ragnarok DLC or paid DLC, paid expansion, uh, which I think is retailing for $30. Now it, its pre-order price was $40, but they dropped the price since then and maybe it'll be lower then and so if you really like donna ragnarok you're gonna really like the rogue light mode for sure and then region three is very much like ireland uh with the wrath of the druids and uh that is in as part of the season pass that was the first paid expansion that you know you might be able to get as the season pass for as low as 25 at the time I'm writing it it's it retailed at 25 individually for for either Wrath of the Druids or Siege of Paris and then the the final region is is uh distinct to itself Helheim and it's just really kind of a dungeon crawl uh you know my criticism with Helheim is that it it offers very little choice uh you can only choose between uh going to the major domo or going to a randomly selected location. The other thing is the locations are not random. The the map itself is is the same, although the challenges themselves and the rewards from the challenges are random. So the it's possible there's some randomness in the NPCs you face, uh, but not not in the locations that you go through. So as you go through the rogue light several times and several different runs where Odin dies at the end or you abandon, 
uh, you know, you're going to be going through the same locations, but, you know, the upgrades that Odin can get or the perks that Odin, Odin can get from doing each one of these challenges, uh, which, which are either lockboxes or swords, those which depend on you defeating all the NPCs or defeating a certain NPC, those those are somewhat randomized what you'll come across. And then there, there are a few uh, hidden stories within it uh, which grant you permanent favors that make Odin more powerful in subsequent runs uh, if you complete those hidden storylines. And those hidden storylines take multiple runs to complete. So I have completed, played through and defeated Hell the Final Boss twice and I've you know done many more runs where we didn't get as far but they're basically uh, the most challenging parts are the bosses uh, and you know in Valhalla one of the weaknesses is that the boss fights especially higher up are not so great so if you're in a kind of low level character uh the bosses of the zealots are actually pretty good uh but you know if you're relatively high level because you've been stripped of all your skills and all your gear uh then the these boss fights are challenging uh, because of the roguelite nature that you just have a blank skill tree, the, a new blank skill tree that you have to fill out. It's a much abbreviated, abbreviated skill tree compared to the, the main game, uh, which have has uh, 535 skills on it at the time of recording, uh, but maybe there's 100 or less skills that you can allocate. You use memories which you get about 40 memories for every challenge that you do you pro you know in a level you'll probably do in in one of the four regions you'll probably do five six challenges uh, and then there are some challenges that will just the reward is memories uh, and then those are basically xp uh, which allow you to buy skill points and slot those in the tree at odin's camp uh, while avor is dreaming after the run is over so you can't slot skill points during a run you also can't change armor sets during a run so for the armor sets you can up you get an armor set for getting into a new region and defeating a boss uh there are also uh there's also a couple hidden armor sets there's one the dwarven defender that is in in uh, in a chest with an illusion that you have to break in Dokerland, the lava place, and there's uh, a armor set that is part of one of those three hidden quests in the Wrath of the Druids type region where the water is acid, and I think that's the Draugr's Toll armor set. But all these armor sets, you do not. So there's seven armor sets you get, but you cannot take them out of mode so you can only use them in the rogue light mode but you upgrade them with thoughts you get thoughts for beating bosses or completing these uh secret quests occasionally you get them for uh finding one of the three jotun chests uh which you have to break an illusion for so thoughts are relatively rare memories are pretty common and then you also get dreams and the dreams that you cash in back in ravensthorpe with Everold, and th there's a full armor set. There's the Death Jarl armor set with a, a shield and at gear and a bow, a mount, and a raven. And then there's a there's a Hell's tattoo set that goes along with it, and some settlement decorations. And it'll take you many runs to get enough dreams to buy out that that shop. So I mean, compare it to a paid expansion. You've got like. Uh, one armor set that you can actually use in the main game versus like Wrath of the Druids you have like seven uh, Siege of Paris I would say I don't know the exact number but it was like four or something like that and then Dawn of Ragnarok I believe it was three or four so it's it's not as big I think as Wrath of the Druids and 
uh, Siege of Paris, but about the same size, you know, if you like the mode and you do several runs. Now, of course, you can do the, you can complete the whole thing in two hours if you have a successful run, but very few people will do that, and you'll also miss out on the secret quests, and you'll miss out on a lot of the other smaller objectives uh, if you only do one run. So I think the typical person's going to need to do many runs uh, to beat hell the final boss. So in terms of the bosses, I think the boss fights are quite good. The first two are relatively easier, but they're quite fast uh, in terms of the speed of the bosses. They have a lot of special effects. Uh, the third is the dragon Nidhogg, which is, is in the uh, Norse mythology as uh, chewing up the roots of the Yggdrasil, the, the tree of life. And then the final boss, Hell, is... Uh, you know, is challenging, but really is is challenging because they have made it very hard to heal Odin in Hell's Castle, and they put uh, damage sponge enemies in front of you before you get to Hell, uh, and so that boss fight with Hell, you're usually just kind of scraping along uh, because you can't heal yourself. I think if had they done what they'd done with the, all the prior boss fights and put uh, an elk shrine in front of the boss arena and a merchant in front of the boss arena, nobody would have any trouble with defeating Hell the first time. Because basically, basically her attack moves and are not anything more difficult than the first two bosses. Um, she is kind of similar to Aleshi in the Witcher lore. That she's kind of like a tree spirit in, in her types of attacks. All right, so I think I've given a good overview of what the mode is like. Uh, I'll give you my rating. Uh, I would say it's like an 8 out of 10, a B plus to me. I felt it was a bit repetitious because that's what a roguelite is. Uh, you know, uh, Ubisoft has been trying to find content that is cut and paste or repetitious that takes a lot of time and this is this is one of their successful things the mastery challenges which nobody liked and had lots of bugs with npc behavior you know i think uh was a complete disaster the river raids were a bit overdone and a bit boring uh but and they had basically two they had two uh, expansion one expansion two plus they had you know new objectives for a third thing without it really adding anything to the, the the river raids but new things that you could buy in the store for a third expansion to the river raids you know i think this expansion does not really add anything for somebody that's like has not played through the game i don't think this expansion adds anything really meaningful to the game uh until maybe you've comp you've beaten it maybe if you've beaten the secret ending, uh, then this might be more relevant to people, or it definitely will be relevant to people that have beaten the Dawn of Ragnarok paid DLC. And it's kind of a tease for that, as as it is a tease for the, the season pass and the Wrath of the Druids. So at, of the, the free expansions, I would rate this very highly. I would rate this as maybe the second or third best ex free expansion. I probably would rate uh, the Tombs of the Fallen, which I think is essential for anybody who has just come to England to go through the Tombs of the Fallen because it is good, uh, and also because it has the best armor set in the game in terms of uh, making Eivor the most powerful and making your play through the, the least uh, amount of times that Eivor dies uh, as possible. The second one, I, I thought the crossover story, adding the Isle of Sky, was quite nice. I always like new story content and new map locations that you can return back to, although I don't return to it that much. Uh, and, you know, if you have all the DLCs, uh, the paid DLCs, there are like six map locations on Earth. There's three map locations in uh, the mythical realms, right? And then you add this mode and you've got a, a fourth 
mythical realm that you can go to visit in Valhalla. So that should give you the idea of how uh, massive the game of Valhalla is. And I suspect most people that own it and that have played it, uh, you know, a substantial amount of time have not completed the main quests. So I, this is, in that sense, it's one more expansion to confuse people about what to play. But I think they'll enjoy this expansion. So I'd rate this as the third best free expansion uh, after the Isle of Sky expansion and the Tomb So the Fall in Part 1. Behind it, I would rate uh, the River Raids, and behind the River Raids, I would put the Mastery Challenges 1 and 2. I am happy that they did complete the storyline of the Mastery Challenges by adding Mastery Challenges 2, and we should get a... Uh, a Tombs of the Fallen Part 2, which is going to explain the story of the Tombs of the Fallen, which I'm kind of, like, that was a story I was not scratching my head about, but there are more tombs on the map, so if they're going to give us more, that would be great, and we should expect that sometime this fall. Uh, I would suspect later in the fall, given this came out in August and, and towards the end of summer. And then we should also expect a end to Eivor's storyline, so the big mystery. And so now we're getting into the spoiler territory. If you're not completed the main game, you're not completed Dawn of Ragnarok, maybe you'll want to leave right now. So this is the spoiler section. You've been warned. Uh, so uh, if you completed the main game, it's pretty clear there's no... There's no reason for why Eivor is in North America. And and I guess you probably know that, that he Eivor is in North America uh, very early. But, you know, having completed the main game, there's no reason to know why Eivor's bones are in North America and they're running the Animus, you know, I think in Massachusetts or whatever. Why did Eivor go to Vinland? There's, no, there's nothing in the Vinland expansion that says Eivor stayed there. And that the Vinland expansion is kind of like early in the game. It, you know, in the, it's like in the first half of arcs that you might do. Uh, it's kind of an arc on its own, although it does, you know, close out the quest with Eivor's rivalry uh, with their his or her antagonist in Norway as a child. So if you t watch Donna Ragnarok, or you played Donna Ragnarok, um, that's all about... Odin trying to free Balder, who's been captured uh, by the Muspel leader, uh, Stuter. You go through this storyline, and you basically find that A, Balder dies, which is consistent with the myths, and B, Balder is uploaded into this piece of Eden, right? So that, but why, and why is this different than the Yggdrasil machine that Odin and Tyr and Thor and Freya were uploaded to, it's hard to say. And so if you look at the secret ending, which you do by doing these platforming challenges and these animus anomalies in England, though the secret ending doesn't show Balder. So the Balder that you see in uh, Dawn of Ragnarok or its sequel, for The Forgotten Saga. So at the end, when you defeat Hell, you get to Odin gets to talk to Balder, and Balder says he's messing with Odin's memories of him uh, so that his enemies cannot track him down. And it seems like he's in the gray, right? He's in he's uh, very much in the computer, the same way that uh, Bassem. Loki was in the computer for a long time uh, until he lured Layla to drop the, the the staff of Eden. So the person that was killed by Loki, right, before they uploaded themselves to the Yggdrasil machine was not Balder. And so the Isu storyline is that there was a Toba catastrophe, all the Isu were going to die, the solution, the seventh message of salvation was the Yggdrasil machine and that the consciousness of this select group of eight people in the Asgardian Isu were going to have sages that were going to appear in the human DNA, you know, the human 
ancestry 80,000 years later, right? And so many of them showed up around Eivor's time, including Bassam, right, as Loki, uh, Tyr as Eivor's brother, Freya as the mother of Valka, and, and many more that you'll find in the story. But I don't think... Uh, Balder, who is the object of Odin's desire that he wants to save his uh, son from death, is, is Balder, Odin's son, was not part of that group. And so I think this kind of teases some something else is going to happen with Balder, right? So Balder is in the gray. He's trying to avoid his enemies. We don't know if that's Loki. That seems somewhat unlikely that it's Loki in the sense that Balder, Balder's is being protected by Hel, uh, Loki's daughter, but maybe she is not in good terms with her father. So I, I, I think that's kind of like the, the, the story progression uh, in terms of the Isu storyline that underlies the whole, the mythical free DLC, Dawn of Ragnarok. So overall, I would say it's a good expansion. Um, go ahead and play it if you're really into the mythical realms. Uh, you might like the roguelite mode as opposed to maybe a more grindy main game. Uh, it's a much simplified crafting system. It's a much simplified skill tree uh, and may seem a lot less overwhelming to players. So players may play it relatively early in their playthrough of Valhalla or maybe they'll play it at the end of their playthrough when maybe uh, Eivor's much too much like a god uh, at the end of his or her playthrough if she gets to uh, power level 535 for example i think the other thing that you know kind of is striking about this this is like because this is after dawn of ragnarok um odin seems more frail in this and they that his character is more frail uh odin also seems a uh, you know you kind of uh, have also explained why Loki calls him the Mad One, right? So it's kind of like he has Alzheimer's, but they hint at that it was Hell's and Baldur's doing that uh, Odin is so forgetful, that they have been messing with his memories, maybe messing with his consciousness in the Yggdrasil machine. It's, it's hard to say or interpret within the Isu thing, but it does seem like at least we have an explanation why Loki calls Odin the Mad One. Uh, it's not just that he uh, poked out his eye or pulled out his eye, uh, but it's, it's also that he does not have control over his memories. And there's a given a reason why for that. Subscribe to the Linus Wilson channel. We give you the secrets to crush Assassin's Creed Valhalla.